pleasure to introduce Bob Stupar, who's a professor in the department. Um, he's going to give his um, MES um, renewal presentation, and he's going to discuss some of the work that his group has been doing with soybean genomics and molecular genetics. Um, and um, his title is Soybean Molecular Variation and Prospects for Improvement. So I'll let Bob take it over. All right. Uh, thanks, Gary. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate everybody for coming today. I can't see you, but hopefully you can see me or at least see my slides. Um, yeah, the, the title I've given is uh, Soybean Molecular Variation and Prospects for Improvement. It's actually the title I've had for this program since 2008 when I started. Um, and probably over the years, about 90% of my effort has gone towards soybean research, or probably better than 90%. Um, but I've also worked a bit with uh, a few other species as well, including sunflower, Metacago truncatula, which is a relative of alfalfa. And, um, and now we're doing some work on pea as well. So I'm going to talk mainly about soybean today, but I'm going to talk a little bit about our pea work uh, in addition to that and some of the um, more exciting uh, avenues that I think our research is going into. All right, let's see if I can advance. All right, so I, it's my understanding that I'm supposed to cover the breadth of our, of our program. So I'm gonna just give a slide or two here that covers the landscape of research we're doing. And then I'm gonna sort of narrow in a little bit on some of the projects in, in, in the subsequent slides. Um, one major area of research we're involved in is uh, in gene editing for soybean improvement. So these are sort of target specific, trait specific projects. Um, primarily funded through the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council. Um, we, in fact, we've got four projects currently that sort of fit under this umbrella, most of which are uh, interested in seed composition traits. We also have one project that's pending right now with the United Soybean Board um, to perhaps uh, add to this portfolio. Um, Another area of, of research uh, that, that we've been doing quite a bit of work in in, in the last decade or so is um, both improving gene editing methodologies, especially in legume crops, and um, also understanding its impact on the genome. So we have two projects um, funded through USDA, with sort of this under this umbrella, uh, two of the, and, and one project with the United Soybean Board. Um, two of these projects that are, are the three that I'm listing here are done um, with in collaboration with Feng Zhang here on campus with, in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. And then one of the USDA projects, and I should mention, uh, Gunvan Patel is actually a, a co-PI on one of our projects as well with USDA. He's a former postdoc with Fung and myself, who's now working uh, as a professor down in uh, Texas Tech. And I should also mention with one of these USDA projects, it's a longstanding collaboration I've had with Peter Morell, who's the lead PI on that project, and some collaborators from Georgia where we're studying the um, sort of the genomic dynamics of, of different uh, plant improvement technologies, including classical mutagenesis and, um, and modern biotechnologies. Um, I'm not really going to talk too much in detail about either one of these areas today. I'm going to focus mainly on the, uh, the following. So we're going to talk uh, uh, a bit about gene discovery projects for um, abiotic stress tolerance. And so right now we have one project, the United Soybean Board, that's focusing in this area that's collaborative with Aaron Lorenz uh, here in our department and Jamie O'Rourke at, at, at USDA and Ames. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the work we're doing in soybean architecture area. So again, this is in the realm of gene discovery, sort of mapping and cloning projects. Um, we have one project that's led in, uh, th th funded through the USDA led by Aaron Lorenz in collaboration with Gary Muehlbauer as well. I'm not really gonna to touch on that today, although this is a very cool project and involves a lot of overlapping themes with the work that I'm going to present, but the work that I'm mainly gonna present is uh, an unfunded project that we've been chipping away at for a few years that I hope to um, write a proposal for in the near future. And then the last area that I'm gonna to touch on is a new area where we've gone into pea breeding and, and genetics. And so we've got a few projects uh, recently funded in this area. One is with the, the FFAR, which is the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. That's a highly collaborative project involving Aaron Lorenz, Peter Morell, and some colleagues from food science, Pam Ishmael and uh, Dan Gallagher. And then we also have a pro pro project funded through the Forever Green Initiative. That's along with several of the other collaborators I mentioned from the FFAR project. And it also includes Waleed Sadak. 
And then last, uh, we have a proposal pending right now, pending right now with the USDA uh, organic program. So it's a pretty diverse uh, menu of, of projects that we're working from right now. Um, but I'm going to mainly focus this talk on these three areas. I'm going to have a segment on the um, IDC work. So this is iron deficiency chlorosis. It's a very important abiotic stress in soybean. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about this unfunded project where we're working on soybean architecture. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the new P work that we're moving into. OK, so <laughs> for some reason, I, this came to my mind this morning. I thought to myself, what are our assets in this project? It reminded me of the Princess Bride when the giant, the swordsman, and the hero are all trying to figure out a way to storm the castle past 60 armed guards. And they all, all they have going for them is the giant's strength, the swordsman's sword, and the hero's brain. Oh, they also have a, a wheelbarrow and a cloak, I believe. And they devise a way to take on this huge task and succeed. Um, I'd say from my experience in the soybean community, it's somewhat different than that in the sense that we have lots of assets to work with. And really my program is built a lot on these public um, resources that have been developed over the last 10 or 15 years. So I wanna give a loud shout out to all of these teams that have put together the genome assemblies for several different genotypes of soybean. Um, that includes a lot of resequencing data recently for hundreds, I think we're into the thousands of genotypes now, uh, resequencing data sets. We're using this data um, on a highly, almost a daily basis um, to try to understand the variation that's in the genome and it's in some of these loci that we're uh, investigating. There's also a uh, 50K chip that was developed several years ago and that's been used to genotype the entire USDA collection. So that means over approximately 20,000 accessions were genotyped on this platform. And um, this includes a subcollection of what we kind of refer to as classical near isogenic lines. So these were lines that were developed by Dick Bernard who ran the USDA Stock Center several decades ago. And he spent a long, a long time of his career developing back cross populations where he brought mutants with unique traits into um, either the background Clark or Harrisoy. And these have been part of the collection since then. And these are part of the genotyping. And I, I actually, um, this resource has, has been very essential to one of our projects that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, another essential resource has been this SOYNAM. So this is the nested association mapping population that was developed um, with the leadership of Brian Deers at University of Illinois and Jim Specht at the University of Nebraska. And this has been a very valuable population for our mapping work as well. And then I also uh, give a shout out to the breeder mapping populations that are being maintained with different breeding programs across the country. We've um, been fortunate to work with, with breeders here, um, both with Aaron Lorenz and his predecessor, Jim Orff. And one of the projects I'm gonna talk about today is really taking advantage of one of Jim Orff's old populations uh, for our abiotic stress project. So those are some of our sort of resource and material assets. And I would also say that on the human side, probably our most important asset has been the team that we've been able to work with here at the University of Minnesota. So this, we haven't taken a, a group photo in, oh, well, since the pandemic began. So on Monday at lab meeting, I decided let's, let's take a picture of everybody. And so this is our current team. Um, this, uh, this team represents a very diverse um, range of strengths from um, genome variation specialties to breeding, physiology, biotechnology. And so it's enabled us to do a lot of different types of projects in the lab, which has been really fantastic. Um, and, and more importantly, they've been great people to work with. Um, they've been, uh, you know, in, in particular, the, during the time of the pandemic, there's just been a lot of positive energy that's come from the group and a lot of um, really, I'd say, resilient um, work, work ethic and uh, the collegiality and the overall performance has not dropped off at all. So I think we've, I've been very, very fortunate, not just with this group that I'm showing here, but with previous members of my lab as well. And, and I'm hoping to inter, interlace their names as they come up through the talk, because they're gonna, there's been work that's been contributed by former students, um, postdocs and, and technicians that are covered in this talk as well. Um, yes, so, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the abiotic stress project. So for those of you who follow the soybean community in the literature, you'll know that probably um, most of the energy that goes into what we think of as stress for soybean is focused on biotic pathogens. And so there's been a lot of work done on the mapping and cloning of genes, say for soybean cyst nematode 
aphid, fungal pathogens, bacterial, viral. Um, so, and, 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 and rightfully so, these are major challenges that growers face year in and year out. And so um, there's been a lot of great successes in this area in terms of mapping and developing markers and, and in some cases cloning genes for these traits. Um, of also of great importance, but maybe less progress has, has been the abiotic stresses that, that um, growers deal with year to year. And so some of these might include drought, um, iron deficiency, cl chlorosis, lodging, things of that nature. And so um, this has been an area that we've moved into in the last couple of years more aggressively. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit and give a little bit of an update on a couple projects, including one that we've looked at in architecture that's really related to lodging resistance, we think, and then the iron deficiency chlorosis resistance area as well. Um, when we talk about architecture traits, there's actually a lot of components to them. <laughs> architecture is important for lots of things, of course, not just lodging, but yield component traits, branching and so forth. Um, but we've really narrowed in on one, this is a, a project that, that kind of came to my attention a few years back when um, Ben Campbell was, was still at the group. He uh, identified as part of a project with um, Aaron Lorenzo's group, um, and specifically uh, Aaron Gilbert, that there was a, a, a mappable uh, QTL for a classical near isogenic line, in fact, that um, they think that they had a pretty good idea of where it was located in the genome based on some genomic analysis they were doing. So we decided to pursue this lead. And so we've been looking at this QTL that controls internode length slash plant height for the last couple of years. Here's a picture of Bruna and Jeff um, taking some measurements on some of the different lines that have come through for internode length and plant height. Um, what I'm showing here is kind of a complicated picture, but I think it's cool. So I've, I've decided to include it in this, in this talk. So what we have here is a picture of the chromosomes of 25 different near isogenic lines. This is just one chromosome, sorry, of 25 different near isogenic lines that map uh, this, this plant height QTL to, to, to this introgression. So what you can do in the near isogenic population is you can download the 50K data, and then you can look at Clark which is the recurrent parent and compare its genome to the near isogenic line, which has a donor introgressed into certain segments of the chromosome. And so what Aaron and Ben did in collaboration with, with Aaron Lorenz's group, and also now Ryan Mary's contributing to this project as well, is they've, find, they've sort of analyzed all these data sets to figure out if there's an inference that could be made about where this gene resides in that chromosome based on overlapping um, introgressions. And so, what you see here is 25 different near isogenic lines. It actually consists of four different crosses. So there's a different parentage in, in these backgrounds. And, uh, and Aaron and Ben and Ryan have looked at these regions and they concluded that it's likely that the gene that controls the plant height trait resides in this area here. So every time you see a little a stretch or spot, any spot represents a donor marker that's been mapped in this near isogenic line, okay? So if you zoom in on this area, I'm gonna show you this in a second. You'll see that this is one, I'm just showing you the leftmost near isogenic line, just zoomed in on this one little area here. So what, we, what I'm showing you is about a hundred markers. Now there's about, there's probably over 2000 for the chromosome. So this is a pretty small segment of the, of the chromosome. What you can see is we can map the donor markers position for this near isogenic line and the recurrent markers position. So the recurrent markers are highlighted in yellow and the donor markers are highlighted in green. And these are all the adjacent markers that are, and anything that's blank is unmappable probably in most cases because the parents weren't polymorphic for that, that site. And so if we kind of add more and more nils to this um, mapping position, you'll see you get one here that looks a little bit different than the other two, where it seems on the south end, you have the donor allele, and then you have a recombination in between these two markers somewhere. And you have now the recurrent parent north of here. And so you can start to see how this can be used as a mapping tool. You add more and more nils on top of it. Now we've got a majority of our nils. We see a whole family of nils here that are all recurrent parents south of this marker and donor parent north. So now we've actually narrowed this region to the, the gene in which, which we believe would be residing because I, I, I'm sort of implying this, but I should say it explicitly, the um, all of these um, near isogenic lines are carrying the trait of interest in this case. So that would be the, the changed architecture, the, the, the um, plant height change. 
And so what we're showing you here now is that we now have a recombinant location here, north of this, this region, and we have a recombinant location here, south of this region. All of these plants should be green for the most part, somewhere within this area here. And then we then there's some uninformative nils here that just weren't polymorphic. But in any case, I hope this illustrates this idea. This is the concept that's been applied to, I don't know, some 30 some traits now. So this is just one locus I'm showing you here, but the, the team that's, that's done this research has done this for several different um, nil families now and several different um, traits have been mapped this way. So in the end, uh, this ended up being about a one megabase interval. And so we were able to go into that region and start fine mapping. Okay, so to do so, we were using the uh, heterogeneous inbred family approach, which was, I think, very nicely laid out in a 1997 paper led by Mitch Tungstra. And I'm listing deers here as well, because he's the group who developed the recombinant inbred lines in which we're using um, the, uh, the, the, these HIFs. So basically what it is, is it's, it's recombinant inbred line population development. And you get to a certain stage in this example, they're showing the F5. They say you can genotype at this stage and identify lines that are essentially identical almost everywhere in the genome. In other words, homozygous everywhere in the genome, but maintain small bits of heter heterozygosity uh, in location in different locations. So what we can do then, because this um, the NAM population that was developed by, by Deers and Specht and, and colleagues, they have genotyping data for all of these lines. So we're talking about over 5,000 recombinant inbred lines. We can go into that data and look at the marker uh, profile for, for the 50,000, or actually they did it on a 6,000 chip. So 6,000 SNPs per line. So we can go in, take the SNPs that are closest to the region that we've mapped for our, our plant height QTL and figure out which plants in the recombinant inbred line population still have heterozygosity that are still gonna segregate for that trait. So we can do order up those seeds and that's what we did. We ordered them up planted them out in the greenhouse and we genotyped lots and lots of plants looking for things like this, looking for lines that had fixed one allele versus the other or lines that were still heterozygous for our QTL of interest. So we could continue to map. So long story short is we can create near isogenic lines immediately by genotyping these individuals as shown on the left and right here. And then we can find more, the potential for more recombination by taking ones that are still heterozygous and growing them out and continuing to genotype those. So we've actually used this approach for both this project and the project that I'm gonna talk about later with IDC. But um, so that's why I'm spending so much time on this slide. It's actually been an important uh, source of, of important resource for our fine mapping. Okay, in any case, we did this, we ordered up the lines, we genotyped them, we found what we thought were near isogenic lines and we put them out in the field. And sure enough, we saw the phenotypes show up. So what I'm showing you here is just a sort of a waste level view of our field as the plants are maturing. And you can see there's kind of a, a wave-like um, shape to this. That's, these are actually four different rows. And you can see on the far left here, these are near isogenic lines, one tall and one short, one predicted to be tall and one predicted to be short. And then actually showed up as, as true. And we found this uh, in several rows in our fields for this um, population. So in some cases you might see from 10 to 20% height differences among these plants um, based on just the single uh, locus. And there's just some more pictures of what these look like. So here we have a tall and a short near isogenic line from one of the populations. Here we have a few different versions where we have a tall version and the short version uh, near isogenic lines. And here's just the parents over here. So Bruna and Jeff did a lot of work in, in uh, measuring these phenotypes and, and really dissecting out where the variation was occurring. And for the most part, it was occurring in the mid-level inner nodes. In other words, there's the same number of nodes in both of these lines but the, the distance of the inner node is, is shorter in the short version. So the whole plant is shorter, but we don't think there will be any sacrifice in terms of yield or uh, productivity. Okay, and so where we are now is we're trying to fine map this interval and we've got it down to, we think about a 300 KB interval, but we have to prove that in the field this year. So I'm just showing six marker positions I've I've taken out the position location just because this is all unpublished data, of course. Um, so what we've got is we've got uh, families that are now segregating nicely for this interval. So we have parents that are identical, that were identical on either side, and then we get different recombination combinations in the internal markers. 
So what we're showing you here are two siblings um, from our last population. We now have bags of seed from these and we can put them out in the field next to each other. So they're identical uh, up, upstream and downstream of our mapped interval and they're um, polymorphic internally. So you've got parent one type here for these three markers, parent two type for these three markers. And we can then predict which one should be tall, which one should be short, which one should have long internodes, short internodes and, and validate this QTL. The other thing that we have that's pretty cool, I think, is we still have some, um, we've been maintaining these heterozygous groups as well. So we've gotten some individuals here that are fully identical north and south of this region, but maintain the heterozygosity of these marker uh, states. So we can do two things with this. Number one is we can actually go and look at the segregating row, genotype each plant, and then um, identify if there's co-segregation between these three markers and the tall, short plants. Um, and also we can look potentially for new recombinations within this interval as well that might help shrink this um, mapped region even further. So um, where we are right now is um, Ryan's actually done a, a fair bit of resequencing um, uh, analysis, uh, sorry, analysis of resequence data in this interval and he's produced a candidate gene within the interval. And I have to be fair, this is a candidate gene Ben speculated on early on when we when we first started this project. So that's still probably our lead candidate. Um, and we actually looked at different alleles for this type for this for this candidate gene, and we found different states that we had predicted different effects of each allele. And we looked at their within each of these um, recombinant inbred line families, um, the effect of the allele on the plant height trait. And we found a nice uh, correlation here. So you can see, and the reason we, I should mention the, the Soynam has 40 different um, unique recombination or recombinant inbred lines, but they're not all polymorphic for this locus. So what we're showing here is the subset of lines that were polymorphic for this locus. And we could look at the measured difference in, in, uh, in the NAM study that found the effect of the real, maybe corresponding to the, to the allele type it carries. At that, uh, at that locus. Okay, and so what are we doing now? Well, obviously we're doing the, the last steps, hopefully of the fine mapping. And then we're also decided to develop CRISPRs for these um, candidate genes. So we've got some T1 CRISPR-Cas9 mutations that we're genotyping currently. And um, we're hoping that these will be out in the field in 2022 to validate um, sort of just exactly what we might see in terms of the architecture changes for these for these um, plants. Okay, so I'll move on to iron deficiency chlorosis. Um, and uh, this is a project by, that um, MJ Espina uh, gave our APS seminar on a couple of weeks ago. So I've borrowed a, a several of her slides. And so um, I, I should mention that, you know, if you've already seen that talk, you'll probably see a little bit of the same stuff. But there's maybe a few few differences as well. Um, I'm showing this slide mainly just to, to illustrate what this trait looks like in the field. So on the, the right here, you see what we would think of as a normal functioning, happy growing soybean row, mini row. Um, where on the left, we have something that looks like it's affected by IDC. So in this case, this is sort of the signature phenotype. You get what they call intervenal chlorosis. So you get a yellowing in between the veins of the leaf. And um, this is usually observed in certain soil types in certain springs. So if, you're, if you have a high pH soil and you have a very wet part of your field, you might see that there's a patch, a big patch of yellow um, um, plants during early development. Typically these plants will recover and grow into normal looking soybean plants, but they will suffer a yield hit from this condition. And in some cases, the condition be, can be pretty severe and have a huge yield hit. Um, and so for this project, we are working mainly on mapping uh, a resistance gene in, in the background, FISCA B3. So FISCA B3 is a, um, a very interesting and unique line. It's, it's originally a Swedish edamame variety. Here's FISCA B here on the map. And then developed by uh, breeder Sven Holmberg many, many years ago. And the reason it became important to, to this project is because Breeders across the country were, were sharing notes some years ago, and they noticed that FISCA B3 seemed to always do very well in abiotic stress tolerance um, tests. So things like drought, ozone, uh, salinity, aluminum, and IDC, they were noticing that's, that um, for, 
for some reason, FISCOB3 always seemed to perform very well. So this became the basis of a project that we now have funded through the United Soybean Board to develop tools and resources for FISCOB3 for the community. And, and par as part of that, we recently assembled the genome and annotation uh, in collaboration with Jeremy Schmutz's group at Hudson Alpha. Um, and this is now available on Phytosome for the uh, FISCOB3 genome. Here's some sources on that. So in any case, uh, the, the population, uh, I'll get into that in a, in, a, in a moment, but this dates back to Jim Orff's time and um, his student, um, Carl Gutenhoff. They were originally doing GWAS and biparental mapping uh, using um, both for IDC in general and within a FISCOB3 by Matter and Ottawa population. And so um, we, we continued to work on this um, as Aaron uh, joined the faculty and uh, sort of scaled up our GWAS analysis. And so his group was able to look at both um, a diverse collection of accessions and advanced breeding lines and map IDC within those populations. And something kind of interesting popped up that I, and interesting to me anyway, is that um, you don't get the same output. Uh, if you look at a diverse accessions, which, which includes a lot of land races, you'll see there's a couple different QTL. You have this big hit on three, five, and six. Whereas in the advanced breeding lines, we're only seeing the hit on five. So this is pretty interesting to me in part because in since I've been working on IDC, really since I've started on the faculty here, in the literature I see that chromosome three is probably the locus that's most been most worked on. And it has a very strong effect for sure. Um, however, I remember Jim telling me, Jim Orff told me this years ago, right when I started, he said, you know, the problem with that QTL is you don't see it. it, it, it it's too detrimental. In, in the land races that carry it, it's too detrimental. It's the kind of thing that's been called out and it doesn't show up in breeding populations. And sure enough, on this analysis here, it turned out that the chromosome five QTL was the only significant hit we had. So um, that's the one we pursued. And so this is just a, a biparental hit on chromosome five, shows the same QTL here. And then um, Ryan's work, part of his PhD thesis was to fine map this locus and he did this quite well. He got it down to 137 uh, KB and uh, 17 genes in that interval. And so this is just a summary of that work where he, he mapped this down to 17 gene models and then took a good long look. So he had a, he had a whole genome assembly to work with he's, and he started taking some preliminary expression data and looked at some of the putative gene functions and, and he settled on a candidate gene for this um, QTL. And so MJ has been uh, setting up some new experiments to try to validate. Of course, this is a very difficult uh, kind of trait to work with, <laughs> but she's been doing an excellent job of, of designing experiments that I think we're, we're gonna help, help us get to the answer here. So she's actually taking experiments within um, both transcription and uh, using a series of like hairy root reporter assays to look at um, levels of expression, where expression occurs, and whether or not iron is accumulating in roots in which expression is occurring. And so uh, and Bruna Bacciarelli is also helping with this, um, with her microscopy expertise. Um, and then a little bit longer term plans would be to do this sort of confirmation in whole plants. So using both plant, uh, a whole plant overexpression system and potentially um, uh, an editing of the candidate gene as well. Okay, so I know I'm kind of, have to, oh, I wanted to say one last thing about IDC, yes. And this is work that Ryan's been doing as, and, and, and um, I think he, uh, he sent me the slide just the other day. It's quite, it's the one I showed just a moment ago, but I think it's really um, pretty impressive. So what he's showing here is on the left, this is a, as I understand it, a, a recent release from the soybean breeding program that has some susceptibility to IDC. When he's back crossed the FISCOB allele, into this background, it's my understanding that what we're seeing here is the, um, the, the, the results of that back cross. So that, that FISCOB QTL on five seems to have um, in, in the standard IDC scoring system about a one point improvement in the um, performance over those plants that are susceptible at that locus. So it's being used and integrated, hopefully uh, will be successful in integrating into breeding populations in a more purposeful way. All right, so I have a few minutes left and I wanted to kind of do a quick overview of our, what we think of our future directions are gonna be in P. 
Um, so when you think about peas in Minnesota, that we have two projects that have currently been funded. Um, the first is the bullet here, um, looking at pea protein functionality and really developing better phenotyping systems for this trait. So this is um, supported by FFAR. And, and as I mentioned before, we're in close collaboration with the food science folks to, to try to, to make this a reality. And then the second project is funded by the uh, Forever Green Initiative. And it's looking more at um, winter pea and to see if we can um, assess and develop lines here that will survive reliably and consistently in the winter. And um, uh, when we think about the classifications, I'm just sort of, and by the way, I, I credit Steve Mulkey with providing many of these slides for uh, the, the P work. He and Nick Waring have been working um, like sort of side by side on developing this P program. So there's the fresh P that we think of, and you might see on your dinner table tonight, perhaps, um, as opposed to dry P. And so what we're mainly working on in, this pro in these projects is focused ideally, and I guess our goal is more on the um, the, the yellow cotyledon dry pea types, because um, these are typically what's used in um, for plant protein in, um, in in the food science world. Um, so, how could peas fit into farmers' rotation? Well, uh, the spring pea, what we think of in, as human markets, uh, obviously that's pretty clear. It's also possibly an alternative to no-till summer fallow. Um, there's also opportunities in winter pea that we that we haven't. Um, we currently don't really have, if we can develop the germplasm to do this, is uh, have a winter cover crop that's, you know, a legume that can help stabilize the soil and provide green manure for the subsequent cash crop. Uh, it can be used in conjunction with small grains to improve feed quality or as a forage. So these are some of the things that we're thinking about as we, as we develop this program. Um, <clears throat> so again, when I think about peas in Minnesota, I, I, I there, when I showed you the Princess Bride slide earlier and I talked about assets, um, I think a lot about how much we've been able to, to utilize some of the community resources and soybeans. So I know there's a lot of people out there in the pea community who are also interested in, in developing more resources in terms of genome assemblies from more diverse and accessible varieties. Um, and, and also the sort of next gen mapping populations, say a, something like a PNAM might be something that developed from a community standpoint, might have really good long-term impacts on projects, not just for the work we want to do, but for the work more broadly by the community. So I think even though I'm kind of focused on these traits and these outcomes, I think it's also important to focus on finding ways to develop these resources as well. And then when we think more about the varietal assessment and development for Minnesota, I think it's safe to say most of the work we've done thus far is focused on winter survival traits um, using both field and cold chamber conditions. And, and we've been very fortunate because as part of his PhD thesis, Nick Waring was already doing this sort of work largely in hairy vetch, but he was also bringing in pea as well. So we've been able to sort of build on that momentum to develop some nice um, preliminary data sets. So here's a picture of, of an example of what our field looks like right now. So this was um, this was planted in the fall, and we actually, this is just over uh, south of Larpenter Avenue uh, in the fields here on the St. Paul campus. Um, we actually had a pretty good year, and, and good in the sense that the, the, there was enough snow cover and insulation that when things got really cold this winter, the plants were pretty well insulated from it. So our survival rate was quite high. We're both, we're assessing a, a combination of public and private varieties. Um, as, as part of a couple different collaborative projects. So we have, I'd say something in the range of about 30 varieties that we're looking at um, right now for, for winter survival in Minnesota. Um, and so we have almost complete survival this year. However, we have a wide range of, of, of vigor and, and recovery from these lines. And this is just a picture that gives you an idea here. So what you've got is um, you've got rye is sort of spacing these rows and then you have, um, a very strong, vigorous pea coming up and um, sort of this sparse rose, you can see uh, a strong example where you have some survival, but it appears very little um, compared to uh, the healthy rows. And you can kind of see down the row a little bit further how these other plots look as well. You have a, quite a bit of variation in terms of, of vigor. Um, in addition to that, so Steve's, Steve Steve Mulkey has been working with 
uh, cold chamber assays, again, uh, building off of, of Nick's knowledge and, and what he was able to generate um, as part of his PhD thesis. And so what um, basically what this is, is it's mimicking um, acclimation and recovery process in a controlled condition. So what, what sh what's shown here is Steve growing many, many different types of varieties, the same types that we're growing in the field and um, letting them grow for a couple of weeks and then starting the, the cold acclimation period for a couple of weeks and then giving them a strong freeze test for 24 hours and then assessing how, how well they recover uh, compared to one another. And, and, and if you go a few days further beyond 33 here, you start to see some real damage. And so um, Steve's been using a zero to five scale of zero damage to uh, meaning zero meaning no damage to five completely dead. And I'll show you a little bit of that data here. So this is kind of what his preliminary uh, out, output has given us. It's sorted here from those that have performed best. In other words, that have showed the least damage to those that have showed the most. This is 16 different genotypes in this assessment. And you can see there's a, and this is across two different growth chambers. So filled versus open diamonds indicate which chamber and then the color represents uh, replication. And so you can see some of the genotypes have performed consistently pretty well in this assessment, while others have been consistently poor. And there's just sort of numerically where the average comes out for these 16 varieties. So we have a pretty strong range of, of um, responses so far. Um, and, and the other thing that we'll be doing in the near future here, hopefully, is we'll be able to compare the field notes and the chamber notes to see how well uh, those two um, cross-validate one another. Okay, so I'll go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, I just wanna sort of circle around and, and remind people that we do have a wide range of projects that are ongoing. Um, and, and I listed these early on, but we have uh, several for gene editing for specific trait improvement uh, projects. We have gene editing for, and for understanding genomic impacts and improving the methodology. We have uh, projects where we're trying to do gene discovery for uh, architecture traits gene discovery for um, IDC and drought tolerance. And also we're developing this P breeding and genetics program. And in this reporting period and the next reporting period, so I'm really using a five-year window here. I, I, I just wanted to note that I've showed you these projects specifically today, because I'd like to emphasize some of these new directions in both the cloning of abiotic stress tolerance uh, genes in soybean and the development of, of P programs that might be, uh, we hope relevant to Minnesota growers in the future. Okay, and my last slide is just covering um, uh, just a, a warm thanks to all of our, our funding agencies that I've talked about today. All these projects are supported by um, a, a very a wide range of, of uh, sponsors, including federal sources like the USDA and FFAR, and then uh, commodity support, which has been really critical for our soybean work through Minnesota Soybean, United Soybean Board, and the North Central Research Program. Um, and then the, the P work has largely been supported by the, the, the Plant Protein Innovation Center here on campus, um, the Forever Green Initiative, um, uh, ProGene, which has um, allowed us to evaluate some of their materials. This is a company. And then, of course, the Egg Experiment Station, which supports me. And um, uh, oh, I should mention, I, in case you're wondering, I don't have a logo for this group, but this is the Legume Cover Crops Consortium. So this is a breeding group that we've sort of gotten involved with in the last year or so as we've integrated more into the, into the pea community. And, um, and with that, I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, all these sponsors again, thank all of my collaborators, members of my lab, and, um, and, and you, the audience. We're, um, it's, been, it's been a great time to work on legumes. Um, it's been very exciting to see the different communities and the directions that they've gone, and I'm excited to see what happens in the next five years. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. So are there any questions for Bob? can put them in the chat, I guess, or do you want, the, uh, the Q&A. Do you want me to stop share, Gary? If you want, sure. Man, my lights went off. There we go. Okay, um, a, let's see here. So, okay. 
So Roger Becker is asking how different or similar are succulent English pea and the dry pea, both genetically and in gene expression, growth, development, et cetera, bringing germplasm in same or different companies. These are great questions and I, I'm not really fully qualified, Roger, to answer all of these. Um, I, I, I think we're gonna, part of our goal is to understand some of the differences in terms of genetics and gene expression um, I think from a, a, I think you'd have to get a, a field breeder to probably handle the questions about growth and development and maybe the infrastructure of companies that support them. I know that the public programs, there's, um, there's some level of, of uh, dry pea and, 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 um, and green pea that's going on in some of the different public programs, but most of the work and most of the time that we've spent has been in addressing the dry pea um, opportunities. So, okay, Jenny just popped up a question. Let's see here. Other than cold tolerance, what other traits are you interested in? Right. Well, for the winter types, right now we're really only focusing on cold. But yes, there's an absolute, and, and, and Gary can probably chime in on this quite a bit because he's told us about all the fungal pathogens we're going to have to worry about in Minnesota if we can actually get this thing to survive the winter. So yeah, that's definitely an area we're going to have to look into, I think, is, is the biotic um, um, pathogens. And um, we're, not, we're not advanced enough to really get into that yet. I know there's been a lot of mapping and, and, and so there's QTL and there's markers and there's, but exactly how this exists in the winter uh, germplasm, I'm not sure yet. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I keep. I'm just. I'm in the Q and A, but there's some stuff in the chat too. So I'll, I'll um, just. I can read it to you, Bob. So okay. this from Peter it says, "Where do you see the larger framing of the proposed research? Is it related to climate change, food security, farm profitability?" Right. So Peter, he he asks, yes. Uh, <laughs> so in in fact, Peter knows a, a lot about this as he asked this question. Um, so certainly the the. The, the, the larger context of the P work is probably easier to answer than in soybean in some ways, because um, I, I, think, I think what Peter might be getting at to some degree is, as we think about transitioning human diets from um, animal sources of protein to plant sources of protein, I think there's a, a strong argument to be made that, um, that legumes are gonna be very, very important in in filling that um, that that dietary need for people, because because they can produce so much protein, and so where is the, where are those protein sources going to come from is actually some somewhat of an interesting debate in these communities. So there's some people who think it should be coming from soybeans, some who think it should be coming from pea, and they have different properties, different functionalities. Um, but I think in terms of you know the broader context and climate change and so forth. Um, the transition, almost everybody thinks the transition to plant sources would be good in that sense um, and probably good in terms of food security as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of, I guess, sociological reasons to say that this is important research. Um, now the specific projects that we're working on are part of that larger concept, but I don't think we've specifically written that into too many proposals as a justification for the, the funding. But we, we could maybe, and, and, and we have to some extent. I will, uh, let's see if I can jump over here. So um, Bishal asks, for soybean architecture, are you also looking at other traits other than plant height? Yes, so, so, so the project that I talked about today is really specific to internode length and plant height, but the USDA project that Aaron's leading is, um, it's, a, it's a much wider breadth of component, uh, architecture components, focusing a lot on things like branch number, branch angle, um, you know, the, a lot, there's a lot of sort of branching and even like leaf angle. It, there's a lot of component traits that we're looking at within that, the context of that project. I don't know, Gary, do you want to add any other traits to, to that list or if they're overlooking anything? Uh, leaf shape. Um... Yeah, it, 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 a lot of it plays into canopy structure and what we think is the most, um, and, and this is, there are people, actually quite good people, and, and especially in, in Urbana, that are asking the question of physiologically, what is an optimized canopy structure? Um, what are the components of that? And so we're, we're keeping an eye on that as well, um, trying to understand the genetics of these traits. We, we've watched, um, you know, especially the, the, the very 
famous stories of, of small grains, um, architectural mutants that have really revolutionized the communities of obviously wheat, rice, so forth. So there's not been as much um, purposeful research in that direction in soybean. We think that there that could be valuable. Um, I see one from Aaron here. What are your predictions for gene editing cap capabilities in soybean in five years from now? Mm, right. So that's a great question because um, the, 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 uh, yeah, the assumption being that we can get, see at, the current state of the technology in soybean is that you have to make transform, transformed plants and then you have to segregate away the transformed construct or the transgene um, to really assess the, the, the trait. And um, so I think there are several people in the community who would say that yes, the, the future is things that are more complex like knock-ins as you wrote in your question here. Um, but I do think that the limiting factor for a lot of groups, at least in the academic sphere, is going to continue to be how many, how many transgenic plants can we push through and how many can we genotype in a reasonable um, you know, design or with a reasonable budget. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think the, the, the thing that I think people would like to see, the next frontier I think people would like to see is base editing in which you could change the base, um, a single base pair changes um, to, to direct. Um, and I think that would probably be the, the first thing you'll see as the next major you know, achievement in, in, in legume and soybean um, editing capacities. Cause I think that has a very powerful impact, but um, it's still, I think being worked out and optimized using you know, model systems to sort of learn from. Um, let's see here. I think that's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah, you're right. That's it. So if there are no other questions, um, let's give Bob a round of applause or give a <laughs> thumbs up sign on the, Thank you. <laughs> the thing or whatever you want to do. Thanks, Bob. That was really good. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, any feedback you can give me, um, that would be wonderful. Just follow up. I'm easy to find by email and uh, I'm happy to chat. Soybeans, peas, anything, anything legumes. Thanks. <laughs>